I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Mm. Happy Sunday. We're back on track. <laughs> yeah. I feel better. Ish. Ish. I think it's allergies that were affecting me. Uh-huh. So Claritin has that under control, I think. Anyway, let's start with uh, RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars Season 6. Episode 8, mm-hmm. which was Snatch Game of Love. Uh-huh. Um, I don't like that format because they usually are split into two groups, the contestants. Yes. I prefer when they're all together to kind of bounce off of each other. But sure, this is what we were given. In the top are Kylie and Ginger. Oh, yeah. Ginger was Phyllis Diller. Yep. And Kylie was Dolly Parton. Uh, Ginger looked crazy as Phyllis Diller. Because <laughs> she's so like... She doesn't look like her. But then she was doing the thing with the legs. How she sits kind of like bow-legged. Yeah, physicality wise was there. But uh, to me, her makeup, she looked like uh, an Annabelle doll. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she was on point. She really was on point. She... Uh, just was like a never ending uh, stream of one liners. So she won, which I think she deserved. Even though Kylie did do a really good job. I um, I would have preferred Kylie. I would have preferred Kylie, but Ginger was super prepared. So she deserves the win. In the bottom are Pandora and Trinity. Pandora was. Who did she play? Uh. From Sex and the City. Kim Cattrall. Kim and Trinity was Whitney Houston. Ooh. So this is our third Whitney Houston on Snatch Game. Wait, who are the other ones? Uh, Monet Exchange. Monet Exchange and Sahara Davenport. Oh. R.I.P. Yeah. Who were terrible. Yeah. Which I think is weird. Be- well, here's the thing. Funny Whitney is going to be like being Bobby Brown Whitney. Or Matt- what's the lady from Mad TV? Right. Deborah. She did a good Whitney. But... The thing is, everyone, like, Monet and Sahara did, like, sort of, like, drug-addicted Whitney. And they still weren't funny. Well, you have to be smart about that. You have to uh, tackle that the right way, and I don't think either of them were smart enough to do that. Well, I don't think Sahara was funny. No. Like, she's not a comedian, so she just totally failed. Monet, who is funny, I think relied too Uh, much. uh, I think Monet's humorous. But I think she did her Whitney and Snatch Game of Love. So the format is just... Because they're being asked, like, direct, like, answering questions. Mm-hmm. So they, they're more on the spot than the actual Snatch Game where they get to concoct, an, like, whatever stupid answer they want to right. a question. In Snatch Game of Love, they kind of have to, like, stay on top. I think more. I think that's more difficult. But yeah... Uh, Monet's was very, she relied heavily on like the sweating yeah. and the, you know, the sort of effect, but Trinity didn't do any better. She looked good, but she, yeah, she did look good. She didn't do well. Ginger wins her lip sync. She lip sync against Heidi in closet. <laughs> Who's cute. Yeah. Her reveal, uh, didn't go as planned cause she walked in wearing a gown with a big, like ball on her head yeah which obviously is like well that's not going to last and then the ball falls off before she's ready Mm -hmm. which was kind of janky but ginger wins and sends pandora home which i think seems fair because she hadn't won a challenge and trinity won two yeah so anyway moving on oh but you know uh a weird thing i was thinking about i guess since we're moving on from drag race after this is we, we had watched um, Oprah interview Jennifer Hudson over her upcoming uh, portrayal of Aretha Franklin in the film Respect, which opens next Friday, and talking about how Jennifer Hudson channeled the physicality of Aretha through how she took up space, which, because being a, a woman, a black woman, in a certain period of time with little agency uh, over her own space... Uh, Aretha navigated the world 
kind of with a lot of facial expressions, I think. Uh, wow. And I was thinking about that in relation to someone like Pandora. And I think gay men, white gay men uh, of a certain age, from a certain generation, uh, I, I think when you grow up being conditioned uh, with certain masculine tendencies, and, you know, white people are pretty rigid, uh, and, and, and not being able to kind of just be your authentic self in your space. And if you've never really had the opportunity to embrace that, to me, Pandora seems kind of like that a little bit. Very talented, and uh, especially in certain arenas, I think she did the best in that American Horror Story Challenge when there, there's time and patience and you know repetition, but just off the cuff being herself, I, I think like a lot of other similar people I've observed kind of have that same rigidity that they're unable to transgress. Yeah, I could see that. Because it, it, it really is about space and how we've learned. It, it, everybody's had that based on how you grew up and what time period ab about what you're able to do with it and how you're able to move about in the world. And I think we we each, everybody's conditioned in a way. And I think that in more restrictive um, environments such as you know midwestern white values you know those are pretty for a, for a young gay kid in that period well those are good points and i think pandora because she's approaching 50 you know she was doing drag in the late 90s before social media and i think as a drag queen in rochester new york which is where she started i believe mm -hmm. She garnered a lot of attention without having to try very hard. Not like be because she did, like, she's a great drag queen, but I think this was at a time when people sought out, like, the fact that there was drag available in that, in a certain area in that time made it a commodity. So someone like her back then didn't have to try so hard to say, like, look at me. Right. Whereas now, well, these queens who are half her age, who really have to go to extremes just to even get noticed. Right. Because none of these young queens who come up now on social media could pack a nightclub. Like if you put their picture on any random gay bar anywhere and said, hey, <clears throat> so-and-so is going to be here on a Saturday night or on a Wednesday night, no one's going to show up because they're, they're not working drag queens. So I think maybe some of that in Pandora's leftover. Her attitude that we see now is sort of left over from a time when she just had to do her thing. Mm -hmm. Like she just had to be a drag queen. Whereas now they have to be photographers and social media experts. And really they have to do everything except entertain. Well, it, to be constantly on and um, engaged in every conceivable way and be talented at everything yeah well so i think that's what's interesting if i had to say what you know young drag queens are probably very good at now it's marketing themselves mm -hmm. but i don't know that you know they're necessarily like entertainers <laughs> well right, well because drag just in its existence was a subversion right and now that it has assimilated somewhat it's somewhat assimilated into a uh stronghold in the mainstream if, if you will and and how that changes the subversive qualities of it maybe it because it's not subversive anymore mm -hmm. yeah so i still enjoy drag it's oh yeah of course i'm not but... shitting on like newer drag queens i just think it's interesting to watch an older you know relatively older drag queen on a very popular show because most of the queens on all stars are older because they've already done a cycle so they're all, all of them really are older than who was on like a normal season, right? Like the last season. Right. So even comparing the two groups, they seem much more sort of like uh, demure, kind of. Well, not demure, like... Uh, they are cognizant of how they will be perceived. Yeah, they're much more self-aware. Yeah. Because they've been burned. Yeah. Whereas the new ones are like... I need, I need to be loud and crazy because I need all the attention. But, you know, and how we progress as a culture and a species, you know, when the 2020s will, when we look back in the 2020s, if the world's still around and 
were doing period films about the 2020s and how... Because listening to Jennifer Hudson talk about having to embody a woman of a certain period, it's like, yeah, like behavior... There was a way people carry themselves throughout any particular era and what was considered... What bodies look like because based on physical activity and what people had access to. Like all of those things are t- in, taken into consideration and just like you've watched many period films where those details will take you out of it. It's curious to think of what... Um, what this decade's gonna look like if we're still around to see people trying to self absorbed. Yeah. Well, I think it'll I, I think representations of people and like younger people in the twenty twenties will be like very, very, very self absorbed. And where will there be nostalgia for it? Like we have this nostalgia as we're probably gonna talk later in a bit, about uh the eighties and nineties and early two thousands even about there's a nostalgia for those periods of the artifacts, the remnants of those periods, like horror films, for instance, or or uh, teen comedies and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I'm famously known for being uh, quite negative, And I think, like, you know, I don't think there's much hope for this world getting any better. So let's say in, like, 50 years, I think there will be nostalgia. There could be nostalgia for, like, let's say the 2020s. Because I think the way things are headed, people will have far less privacy. Yeah. So I think that people will covet the idea that there was a time when we could all be in our own little bubble, like with our device in our hand and document everything and sort of create this narrative for ourselves that, you know, for most of these people isn't even true, but there will come a time when people don't have that freedom, right? Like people will not be able to just freely roam around and... Well, because that just reminded me, I think I saw a post from Madonna talking about remembering when we could live in a time without fear. It's like, well... Maybe for you. For you, girl. (laughs) Like, there's a... uh, If you're straight and white... Some people have been on scared, but whatever. (laughs) Right. Um, Or even, like, you know, I I really like getting on TikTok and just watching content. But it's like, there's going to come a time when people... Well, even if you think, like, like 10 years... Well, maybe, like, the Vine era. So, what is that? Like, seven years ago? The crazy things people would do in public... Mm-hmm. That now you can't. Like yeah. for security reasons, <clears throat> it just wouldn't be as tolerable. Like the crazy stunts people would do, like setting up elaborate pranks and that that shit is becoming Oh yeah, and isn't there a new Jackass film coming out? I'm I'm curious to not that I don't actually never watched any of those, but yeah, that era is kind of bygone. Right. So I think that you know, even nowadays we're seeing like people like Watching TikTok videos, I'm thinking, oh, in maybe 10 years, people won't be so able to, you know, go to a public place and set up a camera and do all this crazy shit and record it. Nope. So I think that could be some nostalgia people find in in this current era. But moving on to movies we watched, I finally watched A Quiet Place 2. You sure did. Um, But, you know, I, I thought it was fine. I already knew the story because we reviewed it. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, with my shitty memory, I did remember all of that movie. So as I was watching it, it nothing really stuck out to me. Like, I felt like I knew every scene in the movie. Sure, but it, it's well orchestrated. And I like that it's basically an endless kind of uh, kinetic energy. That I Because I think the weak point of the first one is when it has to stop to kind of contemplate these characters rather than just their survival. Yeah, you know, I would actually, maybe if one weekend I go sit in a hotel somewhere, I think it might be fun to watch both back to back. Yeah. yeah. I, I do like Emily Blunt uh, and Kristen, and Killing Murphy is the addition in this. And I thought, I think, uh, I'm forgetting the lead girl's name. I, like, I like all of them. Yeah, I will say, though, her putting together, I'm not going to review the plot, but so for someone who hasn't seen it, but uh the the deaf girl figuring out that the song is a call for them to go to this island and her to use her hearing aid to disarm which they had already been doing that like right. like the the film opens with them using her hearing that's how the last film ended but the film the second one opens with her like them evading an alien by using her hearing aid against like an amplifier an amplified speaker so she knew that that was a thing but i think her putting it together that like this like song on the radio is a call for people to go somewhere and that she could then transmit her thing on the radio it felt like a little bit of a stretch i sure i didn't quite get how this girl 
because she can't even hear. But maybe that's why, because the Killian Murphy's character is like, oh, they've been playing that song on repeat. And it's like, and you never thought that that was weird? That there's a point to that? And that there's yeah. a point to it? I mean, I'm not the brightest bulb, and even I would have thought, like, uh, isn't it weird that the song keeps playing over and over again? But then the deaf girl, because she can't really... I don't quite understand what she can hear with her hearing aid, but, I mean, obviously she can hear something, so maybe... If I recall correctly, her brother signs to her what the lyrics are. Yeah, he does. Mm -hmm. So she... So maybe that's how she understood because she wasn't listening to music. She was just told like words and she's like, well, hello, by the sea. Someone's telling us like, go right. by the sea. But then she didn't know that it had been played on repeat because when Killian Murphy tries to say that no one's signing it. And then she immediately starts screaming. Well, I think she can read lips. It just seemed like that. She very quickly connected that this is a message to yeah. that. Sure. And, and I, I mean, thought, but other than that, like watching the entire film, the only thing that kind of came up on my radar is a little like, mm, I have a question, was that? But the more I think about it, it it's not so far-fetched. But yes, I thought the pacing was really good. Um, Millicent Simmons is her name. Yeah. The actress. But moving on, you watched The Wild Boys? Yeah, so uh, it, I'd, I'd been aware of it. I think I had it. I think I had a ticket for it at Outfest in 2017 that I couldn't go to, or 2018. Uh, the Wild Boys, directed by Bertrand Mondico, who has directed quite a few short films, kind of an avant-garde, avant-garde uh, queer art house filmmaker. He directed several music videos, including for M83. Um, just premiered uh, his second film, After Blue, uh, at Locarno, which I was able to see and reviewed at Ion Cinema, and I, I loved it. Uh, but the night before I saw it, I thought I better watch his first film, The Wild Boys, which is also very interesting, uh, and I highly recommend it. it. It's only streaming on Apple TV, unless you want to buy the DVD. Uh, but The Wild Boys is about uh, a group of young, rebellious men who are all played by young women. Oh. Uh, and they murder and rape... Um, their English teacher, basically, and their parents sell them to this captain uh, on a boat who basically is supposed to turn them into good people. Uh, kind of Lord of the Flies meets a clockwork orange and then thrown into this Robert Louis Stevenson Treasure Island, Swiss Family Robinson thing where they end up on this island where these hairy peaches make them change their gender. Uh, and this oh. scientist... Uh, played by Alina Lowenstone, who's looking very John Hurt, was this man that went to the island and has figured out what this fruit does and has uh, mutated into a woman and has decided that this is how we're gonna, we have to move forward with the world um, is by turning it into a matriarchy because men are evil. <laughs> well, that sounds interesting. It's very interesting. It's very visually evocative. Um, I think I liked After Blue even more, which is a similar kind of, madness and matriarchy thing where earth is diseased and the only planet that they f find inhabitable is this planet called after blue and men aren't able to survive there so it's just women oh uh but also brilliant crazy weird things and a, a great soundtrack and everything i just yeah I, definitely a filmmaker that uh very much on my radar now next is fear street 1978 which is the second film. Yes. The first film is 1994. 94. So um, I tried to watch 1994 and I was having a hard time because it, it just felt frenetic and I was so tired of the music. So um, so, I'm so I'm assuming you watched the second one thinking that because of the date it was the first one? I, well, it was very late at night I started it and... It came up first on Netflix when I opened it, so I just started it oh. and then quickly realized that, oh, they're flashing back to this 1994 film. But I was like 10 minutes in and I was already irritated. I'm like, I, I already know I'm not going to like this. Yeah. So let's just bulldoze into it. And I did. And I found it very tedious. Yeah. I, I feel like I can't even comment on the one I watched. I, I did watch all of it, but I couldn't pay attention. I was so distracted by... The score. Well, it, it yeah, the it does this terrible thing of it can't it it's restless. So yeah. every 
every free moment there's a, a popular tune from the period being played and it's just very distracting. There's no suspense. Uh, it's like a YA film, a gory YA film, which, you know, part of the reason that I think... It, it, I mean, do we want to talk about... Well, now that... I, I meant to do this film last, so I feel like now that I did it out of order, we should say... But you wanted to talk about nostalgia porn. Yeah, these films are... And I think been... and I think we should get more into that. So let's put a pin in that okay. and move on to the next. I have something... Uh, she Will? Yeah, so I'm covering Locarno oh. right now. Um, and I happen to be able to review a new film called She Will. It's a directorial debut by... Uh, Charlotte Colbert, I believe it's the director's name, but I wanted to see it because it stars Alice Kriege, uh, who, as you know, is a favorite of mine because she, from Sleepwalkers, she's the Borg queen in Star Trek First Contact, and, uh, of course, the witch in the last Gretel and Hansel remake. Uh, but she's been around forever, and in genre work. Like, she was in Ghost Story in 1981. She played Mary Shelley in um, Haunted Summer for Yvonne Passer. Uh, this is a she plays a, a actress who has just undergone a double mastectomy and is traveling to the Scottish Highland Highlands in a, at a retreat with her nurse. There's an art teacher there played by Rupert Everett. Uh, she's upset that she's not alone. She starts having memories about. As a 13-year-old girl in the late 60s, she became famous for this movie she did with a director played by Malcolm McDowell, but he basically sexually assaulted her under the guise of a relationship. And sh things start happening because this retreat is on the soil where all these witches were burned. and it It's very kind of folk horror, uh, and she starts being able to exact revenge kind of in her dream world, but they're manifesting in reality. Uh, very kind of demure but the mood is great and uh Kriege is you know a, a, an exceptional presence to watch and mm. i did enjoy it what's mad god mad god was interesting also locarno i think it's playing at fantasia fest this month too it's 30 years in the making from phil tippett uh he's kind of a special effects guru who worked on indiana jones and the star wars films and i think was a protege of harryhausen's even uh but he's been cobbling this animated film together it's actually hybrid because the director, Alex Cox, does star in it as well. Uh, kind of nonsensical because it's been 30 years in the making. He's just kind of cobbled it together and it's kind of a, a Frankenstein monster feeling movie. Uh, there's no dialogue, uh, just this series of images in this kind of dystopic universe that some are arresting, uh, but it does get a bit tedious. But I, I think worth watching, especially if you like um, genre anime. Lastly, Our Men. Our Men. Oh, yeah. I just uh, happened to catch up with uh, Rachel Lang film that closed the director's fortnight. I had a screener for it. It was starring Louis Garrel, which was okay. Oh. Um, so something you said you were interested in is a film called El Fantasma de la Sauna. Yeah. Uh, the Ghost of the Sauna? Yeah. The, it's, a, <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's a queer musical set in a gay sauna, a gay bathhouse. Oh. Uh, I think it's a debut film from uh, Louis Navarrete. Uh, and notably as the sauna owner is Antonia San Juan, who you might know as Agrado, the trans character in the Almodovar film, All About My Mother. Oh, yeah. Um, it sounds, based on what I read about it, it sounds... I'm already interested. Yeah, it sounds very good. Because um, I haven't been able to follow... Uh, I haven't read about a whole other slew of new projects. Um, I didn't tell you... Um, oh, actually, one other project that I read about that sounds interesting, uh, Chronicle 2, okay. which is a sequel to the 2012 Josh Trank film Chronicle, but this will be from a female perspective. Uh, no directors are cast yet. The producer has just said that that might be moving forward. Um, and I wanted to mention two films that... Uh, I believe open this week that we did not cover on Fish Jelly. Okay. Um, Never Gonna Snow Again. Uh, did you watch that? Yeah, I covered it. Oh. Uh, it premiered in Venice last September, uh, and I covered it there uh, remotely, of course. Uh, Malgorzata Szumowska uh, is a, a Polish film director I really like a lot. Uh, she co-directed this one. I think it's the first time she's done that with her cinematographer, Michelle Englert. Uh, it's about a masseuse who's providing services to these women uh, in this kind of closed-off community and kind of kind of bizarre. There's some sci-fi-ish elements to it, but I, I did quite like it. Uh, that was released, this I think this week, 
the courtesy of Kino Lorber. Got it. And John and the Hole, which I wish if we had had more time this week, I would have asked if you wanted to watch that. IFC is releasing it. It was a contentious film at this year's Sundance Film Festival. Um, I think I told you about it because I reviewed it uh, about a young kid that hides his family in a cement bunker and throws bread to them and leaves them there. <laughs> What? Yeah, uh, with, uh, what's his name from Dexter? Michael C. Hall and, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the mother right now. Anyway, but that is definitely worth a watch and a lot of people had a problem with that. Moving on, two people uh, have passed recently who were cast members on a show I liked as a kid um, called Night Court. Yeah. But Marky Post and Charlie Robinson have passed. Yeah. That's a bummer. Yeah. Well, how old was Charlie? Well, she was, Marky Post was 70. Marky Post was 70, and then Charlie was, um, I'm assuming, older. But, uh, um, yeah, that's a bummer. Did you watch Night Court? Yeah. He was 75. Yeah, I remember, I remember that as a kid. But uh, Marky Post was on my mind uh, several months ago because we watched a life. My sister and I actually. No, I watched this movie. No, you watched with me, and I was telling my sister about a movie on Lifetime starring. Marky Post and Candace Cameron. Candace Cameron that involved the aliens. Because is it Visitor in the Night? I'm sure that's right. Um, but yeah, so then I went on this sort of like uh, internet whole K loop sort of situation, looking at pictures of Marky Post because she was she was very fit mm-hmm. back in the '80s, and there are a lot of photos of her wearing like these really sort of like '80s you know style like bikinis and. <laughs> So she had some good style. But yeah, she gone and uh, Charles Robinson also gone. All right. The Before we get to the main topic, which is silly, um, you wanted to talk about nostalgia porn. Oh, yeah, because I, I just, you know, like this trilogy of the Fear Street films, which who knows if I'll finally watch all three, since I'm a completist, probably will. But, uh, you know, these things that make this minor blip and then nobody talks about again ostensibly, which would bum me out if I was the filmmaker. But, uh, like, it's just, you know, I often have these experiences because I watch so much. I'm like, am I just in a bad mood right now? Because I just don't get who this is for or why they want it. There's, it's just derivative in the sense that, oh, we're supposed, we're going back to a period that we revere. It's kind of like how I feel about lots of American Horror Story, um, seasons that it's just uh, like cheap fast food if you're it's okay to i think nostalgia is death and i know i've said this before and maybe on other topics but i I, if you are going to pay homage fine like the example i always have is get out which is basically a recobbling together the separate wives but in a new contemporary way jordan peele made it his own with his own things to say but it still is in conversation with the past that's fine uh, but you can't just do something without any kind of conviction because that's what that that makes it derivative and i think at least the fear street 1978 i saw just felt completely derivative there was nothing exciting just b- bombarded with music characters that I, I don't care about and yeah there's a little more sexuality but then you're not you're not providing any other dimensions on what these people's lives were like then in ways that we weren't able to see because of conservative restrictions on cinema in that period itself sure and I think what you're describing there you know it's this balance between art and having a voice in like a business model. And as a business model, it makes sense to revisit topics we know had popularity. So, and that happens in all areas, right? From fashion to music. That's very common in music is to sample popular songs from a bygone era and... Yeah. Right? So I think with film, it makes sense that basically something like Fear Street, the Fear Street trilogy, which is based on a book, to be fair, but I don't. I haven't read the book, so I don't know if it was stylized more for Netflix to meet sort of that audience's needs. But like, you know, a lot of this shit is just sampling the classics, right? Like eighties, seventies, and eighties horror films are just being sampled. Well, it, it it reminds me of that line Taika Waititi says in Free Guy about 
Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, he goes, if you like... Uh, what is the he, line? If you like turkey... He's like, I'm not going to open up uh, Albuquerque. No, he said, if I own Kentucky Fried Chicken, everyone loves my chicken, but you say you don't love my chicken, I'm not going to all of a sudden start making Albuquerque boiled, boiled turkey. turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really good, because I often think that, like, yeah, people want to... Like, go find what it is you really like. And I think that comes, like you were probably about to say, I think that relates to this topic in that it's like, if you want, like, if you're really craving, like, the uh, like a Nightmare on Elm Street vibe, then just go watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I understand being inspired and taking things and f- for business purposes, just for the artistry, because everything is just borrowed off something else. That's, so. But it's fi- we it's inevitable that we are inspired by other narratives that interested us if you are indeed creating your own. But what do you have to say? And, and, and is there a different way you have to say it? Like what, right. what is unique about this? Right. A pair of sisters that hate each other. And one of them's a witch or, Oh God. Like, well, and then what you said initially, like, who's this for? Right. Because a lot of times we're hearkening back to a time that's like, but if the core audience is going to be like 18 to 30 and you're referencing something that was made before they were born, yeah, I often watch things and I'm like, you can see the references, but then... Or... I'm so confused, like, who they think is going to watch this movie. <laughs> like, the same director that did all three obviously wasn't around in 1666, but I think was also born after 1978. So it's like, well... How are you correctly channel- channeling the attitudes and energies? <laughs> well, I don't think that's necessary. But, but yeah, I, I, I think it's sometimes done with great effect and then sometimes it's just like this just seems like a like a cheap like, cash grab cash grab like yeah you're you're just giving me whatever's popular right now yeah um okay the main topic is something super silly but i felt like it you brought it up and i thought it's something you probably have a lot to say um i think there's a lot to talk about that isn't necessarily related to like film or tv or entertainment but um, this in the news uh, has been sort of a number of celebrities talking about their bathing habits, and I think it started with. So I was going to call this episode "Stinky Celebrities," oh god! <laughs> but I think it started with Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, and Mila Kunis basically saying like they don't wash their kids until they're dirty, Ooh. and that they don't really, you know, like regular bathing is not necessary. But again, not unlike the Matt Damon F slur situation. Um, taken somewhat out of context um, because what the, like the headlines are like, Oh, Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, um, Kristen Jake. Bell and Dak Shepard, now Jake Gyllenhaal. And then even like Dwayne Johnson saying he does bathe regularly. These people weren't saying they don't bathe regularly. They were saying that it's not necessary to wash all of your body every day. Like you just need to hit the three P's pits, privates and piggies like your feet. Oh, which is what I do. I generally just wash my underarms, my genitals, my asshole, and then my feet. And then, of course, I wash my face. But <clears throat> if I haven't been, like, super sweaty or out and, you know, like, if I mow the lawn and work out, I'm going to wash all of my body. Um, but that's kind of what they were saying, which I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Just like how you shouldn't wash your hair every day, um, it, depending on who you are. But then what did catch me as kind of gross is both Mila Kunis and Dax Shepard and Kristen Bell said that they don't wash their kids until they're like visibly dirty and stinky. And I thought that's disgusting. Like that should be the headline. Like y'all got these muddy ass kids running around. Um, But so it's just a very stupid, silly topic of, um, you know, but then I was thinking more about like personal hygiene and how we learn Mm-hmm. And I was thinking so many cringy things about myself, like just not knowing a lot of things or people having to tell me about certain things. And so then I thought, oh, it might just be fun to talk about without getting too personal. Like just so my first thought is like, you don't like. So I really like wearing cologne. You, yeah. And I'm just going to give some examples of my favorites in case anyone wants to send me some. So my favorite right now. <laughs> My fa- Well, then I have questions for you about it. But I think right now my favorite... So I'm wearing two right now. Um, Le Labo Santal 33. Which I bought you. Which is probably my favorite. 
Um, and then I also like Victor and Rolf's Spice Bomb. Mm-hmm. So those are my two that I rotate right through right mm-hmm. now. I also really like um, Chanel Blue. Mm-hmm. I like um, Mugler's Angel for Men. That's a favorite. That's old school. I also really like Swiss Army's fragrance. But anyway, just in case anyone wants to know. But for you, I what do you think about me wearing cologne? Because you don't ever wear cologne. In fact, I think in all the years I'm, I've known, since I met you, when I first met you, you had a bottle of Curve or Jupe? Jupe. Jupe. You had a bottle of Jupe. Which was old. Which was old, and I don't care for you. <laughs> it's not a bad fragrance. It's not something that I would wear, and it didn't match you. And you never wore it. And then I think one time I bought you a bottle of YSL. Yeah. And you never wore it, so no, I, I wore it. Oh, didn't I? I'm sure I did. Sporadically, I am the one who probably used it all. So, two things. How do you feel about me wearing cologne and why? And what is your relationship with like a personal fragrance? Not your body odor, but just like wearing a cologne. Um, I like how you smell. Uh, it's often one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, that smells really good. Why don't I do that? But I also like my own personal fragrance. Uh, but as a, you know, I, I think as in junior high, that's why I had all this youp because... My best friend, who I really wanted to emulate at the time, that was his signature. Um, so my grandmother would just, like, at every holiday, buy me. I couldn't go through it fast enough. Uh, and, I, and I was wearing it regularly. And then I didn't realize, you know, it expires. So I met you, when I met you, I was 23. So, yeah, the bottles I had were probably... Quite old. Well, no, because she would have been buying them for me still. So some of them... The, the most five years old. Anyway, I also remember... I remember liking it a lot, though. And Cool Water. Oh. Uh, and uh, Yves Saint Laurent, something or other. Uh, the one I bought you. Yeah, I remember yeah, liking that's that. That's just YSL. Yeah. Um, so, next, I think my dad was very into cologne. And I remember just really loving how my dad smelled. And he would often give me, like, as his bottles were getting low, he would pass me, like, the bottle that mm-hmm. maybe had another 10 squirts worth. Um, and I just remember cherishing those bottles and just not, like, just loving that I had cologne. And I think there's a lot. So I, I have an old friend who I won't name uh, who was very self-conscious about his personal hygiene because he got picked on a lot mm-hmm. for sort of being, like, a dirty, smelly guy. Because he didn't have access. Like, oftentimes he was homeless and didn't have... So he was very sensitive about smell. So he would often wear a lot... He would douse himself in cologne because he was so paranoid. And I don't think that that's... I, I, I don't think I feel that way as strongly as someone like him did. I, I, I do feel self-conscious about someone thinking I smell bad. And I think that's why I wear cologne. But... Primarily, I just really like how I smell. Like, I really like when I get a whiff of myself. You know, my car smells very strong. Mm -hmm. And I just love every time I open the door and, like, I get a whiff of the smell. Because I spray cologne in my car. You, but when you say yourself, it's of yourself with the cologne. Yes, my personal, like, my body odor. So we'll get into that in a second. But, like, my personal body I mean, I can tolerate it. Uh Like, I'll smell my own armpits or, like, my sweaty underwear and i'm like oh that does that smells okay like it's nice Uh to me but i always operate under the sense that no one else wants to smell my you know like my sweaty butt crack or my underarms i would disagree i'm sure there are some people who would want to but um Uh in general i think like you know it's just like not socially polite to not to stink to stink basically (laughs) to stink yeah so i think that's often what i think about when I smell people who stink is like you don't you're not really being considerate of the people around you sure so did your dad wear cologne yeah I remember he well not cologne per se he liked that brute oh aftershave aftershave yeah yeah yep. so that that's a smell I uh have recollections yeah. of did you ever wear aftershave no oh no but I had brute uh deodorant for years gotcha probably before you though um, cause it was chalky. I got to an age where I was like, I don't like chalky deodorant. Sure. Then as we were talking about this earlier, I thought I was probably like in my late, uh, 
maybe like 15, for, maybe I was 14 or 15 when I realized that my aunt, one of my aunts actually told me, like we were talking about bathing and she was saying like, oh, don't forget to wash your belly button and behind your ears. And I remember that being the first time I realized like, I'm supposed to wash my belly button <laughs> and I'm supposed to wash behind my ears. I don't think I, I knew that. You never noticed it could smell if you didn't. I don't think I ever dug in my belly button. Oh. Yeah. But then I cringe thinking, God, I probably was such a, you know, like I, I cringe thinking how many people witnessed me with a dirty ear mm. or like that I smelled kind of bad because I just didn't know any better. Yeah. I mean, well, if not, somebody's not directly showing you, which as a kid, you kind of need to show them. But, uh, and my mom was, you know, like she bathed me as a kid and I remember her saying like, you got to do this, you got to do that. But then really, but it's funny what, you know, I'm sure every kid doesn't retain everything. Well, and I don't think I retained a lot of things because as I got older, like as an adult, I think I also became much more aware of my personal hygiene because there are people in my personal space. Yeah. Like I'm having sex with people. So I'm more aware of like, oh, I need to make sure this is clean. This is clean. I smell nice, whatever. But as a 10 year old, it's like, well, no one's all up in my business. So like, I'm not super thinking that like, oh, this needs to be cleaned or this smells funny. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Do you have any embarrassing like personal hygiene stories that are appropriate to share? (laughs) That are appropriate to share? I don't know. I, yeah, um, now that I'm thinking about it, probably not appropriate to share. I have embarrassing ones for sure, but uh, the, as a but as a, a kid, like you know, I never really shit my pants anywhere as a child. So. Um, well, you know what just came to my mind is not when I was like in college, so probably like eighteen, nineteen, and that's when I first started going to a gym. Because mm-hmm. I had never worked out before. And I was kind of like a pudgy ke- teenager. And then my senior year, I lost a bunch of weight. So I was skinny. But then I went to college. And then it's like, oh, now I'm gay. Oh, gay culture means everyone has to be fit. So yeah. immediately I had to join a gym and work out all the time. And I don't think I understood like how gym clothes can smell like mildew. Yes. Like if they don't dry properly or they're not washed properly. Or sometimes I would wear things twice. Yeah, I can't do that. Right. And I didn't know because I'd never worked out and I, and like things did smell, but I think I thought like, oh, it's like the gym smells or the machine smells. So I cringe thinking like, oh my God, this, like, I'm like that gross guy at the gym who smelled like mildew. I think even at your worst, you probably haven't smelled as bad as some people I've smelled at the gym. Oh, sure. Um, you know, actually I will bring this up, uh, only because I feel like people don't really talk about it and I'm well beyond feeling shamed. Uh, I was a bedwetter. Oh, yeah. Me until, too. T- until I was 12. Until I, until puberty hit. Oh, yeah. I wet the bed until probably like 12. And I, I often forget about how strenuous that was on me and of course my parents and kind of the things that you have to adopt to... Uh, you know, because we didn't have a lot of money, we couldn't keep rebuying mattresses. So you know, the the things you would you the because they didn't know why. Uh, it, I do remember doctors saying like, once he hit, don't worry, once he hits puberty, it'll go away, and it did. It just stopped. But you know, they you know, my poor parents were trying everything. Like we're gonna create a calendar, and every calendar, every day that you don't um, wet the bed, here's a sticker. There'd be one sticker on these goddamn calendars. Or they started. My mom started sewing this like alarm into my um underwear so that once it gets wet it starts beeping but <laughs> so i don't know how many nights where i'd like wake up bleary and just this terrifying beeping and by the time that it's beeping there's already a lot of urine out <laughs> you know what stopped me because it was embarrassing and then the process of taking the sheets off and then everyone knows because i have siblings so then and they my siblings are a, like younger than i am but they didn't have the same problem My brother and sister didn't wet the bed. So it was so embarrassing that I'm the oldest one and everyone in the house knows that I wet the bed because it'd be like three in the morning and there's all this commotion on a regular basis because I have to, I have to fix the bed in order to go back to sleep. Yeah. But I think what clicked in my head is I remember my dad who was not always the kindest person. 
because he would often say that I'm lazy and fat and blah, blah, blah. But he said that I'm wetting the bed because I'm lazy. And for some reason, that made sense to me. Because in my, in my dreams, I recall thinking like, oh, in the dream, I'm about to pee. Right. So yeah. why don't I get up and pee? And I, I remember him saying, like, you're just lazy. That's why you do that. And then I thought, oh, I'm not going to let him call me lazy. Because he would always say, like, you're going to marry a fat woman because you're lazy. He would say really stupid things to me. But I think because I was angry about that, I thought, I'm not wetting the bed again. Okay. The next time I think that I'm going to, like, in this dream, I'm going to pee, I'm going to get up. But it is traumatic, and it uh, is embarrassing. I mean, yeah. well, that didn't work for me. I, I really had to wait until my body yeah. started changing. And maybe he was right. Maybe I was just lazy. and Because once it clicked with me that I, I can get up, like I'm aware that I'm about to pee, I'm just not getting up, then I started to. But everyone's different, and I know that it's not a function of a laziness for everyone. But yeah, it, I often don't think about it. Even when I hear people talking about bedwetting, because there's a comedian... Is it Mark Norman? I think he has a bit about bedwetting. That sounds right. Yeah, Yeah. even when I hear him, I don't... It doesn't bring back memories. Um, I don't know if I block them. But yeah, I was a terrible bedwetter. Yeah, it was... Well, because, you know, it stops... You can't really have sleepovers with friends. And yeah. Because like, uh, you'll ruin these... Or books. go to my cousins and stay the night. Yeah. Because I'm going to pee in someone's... Um, but another story that makes me cringe is when I was 18, I was working at a bank, and which after I tell the story, you will probably confirm that I am this way, but I was working as a teller at a bank at a Wells Fargo, and um, there are a lot of like merchant customers who come in, like local businesses that bank with the bank, and back then, this was 1997, um, they would come in and make their deposits, like all their cash. And there was one dentist I remember, and I remember him because he was very good looking. And I, I know this story. Yeah, and he would come in very regularly to make, like daily, to drop off checks and cash uh, for deposit. And one day he said, could I talk to you? And he like, because I was like in the middle of the teller line. So I walked over down to like the end. And he's like, you know, um, I, I, I know you're probably not allowed to like chew gum or anything when you're at work, but for your breath, you can like, if you drink water and rinse your mouth, that'll really help with your breath. And when he said it, I was like, okay, it didn't. And then after it clicked what he's telling me, oh, I was mortified. And I, and then now I'm sure you will verify that I'm always very concerned about my breath. Yeah. I'm very self-conscious. Like, does it stink? Does it stink? I need to eat a mint. I need to brush my teeth. Um, so, yeah. But. I, but that was good advice because really, if you are well hydrated, unless you have some kind of problem going on. Well, it's not just being well hydrated. It's, you know, even the commercials that you see for like Listerine, a lot of the particles that are stuck in between your teeth you cannot get out with brushing alone right and rinsing your mouth out will get out more than brushing right so it really is important you don't have to buy listerine or anything else you can literally just rinse your mouth out with water before you brush your teeth and floss and you will get so much um it'll be so much more effective well yeah because it doesn't allow this bacteria to build up and that's where the smells are coming from right but even like Br brushing can't reach the places right. so it's not that they're lodged in there so tight it's just like these bristles aren't getting to these places that you if you just rinsed your mouth out but anyway so many things that i think like it's just interesting to hear people talk about their hygiene practices when they're children when i wish like i, I wish we teach young people better hygiene practices like to be more aware of certain things and yeah strangely I don't remember in health class when I was a kid that they really spend any time on that. That being said, you know, there's this argument that like our body's natural oils and we'll clean ourselves. That is true to a degree. Like you can't strip your nat your body's natural oils without resulting in be feeling dry, right? Yeah. And then your body will overproduce oil, which can then create a scenario where you have breakouts and whatever. But I think you really have to do what makes sense for your body. And what you If doing? I exercise every day, which I do then I need to bathe my entire body every day yeah, because I have shit all over me. Like I'm on this workout mat that's not clean. There's bacteria on it or, or just how you're running and then you put on sunblock and it's like, well, you got to wash that off. You got to wash that shit off. But if you're just like, 
Working at home, not very physical. Well, and also what your diet is. Like, there there are other factors. And also, you you know, everyone always t- comments on, like, people always comment on, like, how clean my car is. But it's like, I don't do a full detail every other day. I clean what's dirty. So, like, if the windows are dirty, I'll wipe my windows. If the driver's side got messy from the sprinklers, I'll wipe the driver's side. <laughs> like, I'm not fully detailing my car every day. I just work on what needs to be cleaned when it gets dirty. And I think that's kind of how bathing should work. (laughs) Like, at the bare minimum, you need to wash your asshole because you probably had a bowel movement that day. Right. So it's like that. And then your armpits, if they're hairy especially, and you've been sweating, those can smell. Your face, you know, you have to adjust your uh, skincare routine based on your your skin's activity. And then the last thing I want to say about that is... (laughs) You know, all you ladies out there with really thick hair, like long, thick hair, who like to wash your hair every day. Mm -hmm. And then, so er, like every morning you get up, you wash your hair, you put it in a bun, like a loose bun, and you go to work. Or you put it in like a ponytail. You cannot do that because your hair never gets dry. It stays wet for hours and hours and hours every day. You smell like mildew. And no one will tell you, but I will tell you. I've done thousands of people's hair. And every lady who washes their hair every day who has thick hair and does that same fucking thing where they wash it, towel dry it, clip it up and go to work. Your hair smells like mildew. Just like how if you left clothes in the washing machine for three days and never put them in the dryer. That's how your head smells. And yes, someone has to get close to it. Or yes, it has to be activated with heat or sweating but the shit stinks so it's counterintuitive because i've actually told some women this like you know your hair smells like mildew you need to not wash it every day and they're like well it feels so gross to not wash it every day you know what's more gross smelling like mildew right and you you, if your hair is very thick and has texture to it it's not getting dirty in a day you could probably go five days before it would get dirty but then there are ladies people who have very fine thin hair And if they don't wash it every day, it would look like they comb their hair with a chicken bone. Mm -hmm. So you have to do what makes sense for you. Yeah. So I think that's with everything. Like, you have to do what makes sense for you. If your feet stink, you need to wash them. But also, you probably need to, like, make sure that... They're dry when you put your socks on. And that, you know, you can't wear the same shoes every day. Like, your shoes need to air out. You know, there are a lot of things that I think... Maybe, you know, there are a lot of adults out here who don't know, like, personal hygiene... So, well, I th- I think that it's funny that it's a story because, you know, also celebrities have the kind of privilege of getting to ponder these things about themselves in the first place. <laughs> That's true too. That's true too. Because many people grow up and having to as a young adult just jump start a routine without ever questioning why or how things are done. And you know, I'm inclined to not fully believe I, I think a lot of people say outrageous shit because it's like, you know, with those kind of bodies they have, they're exercising every day. You mean to tell me you did a full-on workout. Right. And you didn't take a... You're just fucking nasty, girl. Why are you telling people that you don't wash all of your body every day? Because Mila Kunis is working out every day. That lady is not just like lounging, not getting sweaty. Right. B- by the looks of her. So, it's just weird. But is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no. Do you have anything in closing? Uh, I don't. I'm sure you have a a poem. I have a quote. Oh, well, go ahead. From Hannah Arendt. Okay. The sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be good or evil. Oh, interesting. Okay, toodaloo. (laughs) Bye.